Hey everybody, this is Bazzy D uh, from Source Gaming. Uh, with me today is uh, one of our uh, article contributors, uh, Wolfman. Say hello. Hello, I'm here. <laughs> Um, and we're here to give our impressions on Netflix uh, Castlevania animated series, which uh, just dropped um, for us about a week ago. So, yeah, Castlevania, um, another in the long line of video game adaptation. Yep. What did uh, what, what, what's your initial thoughts on it, uh, Wolfman? It's definitely on the higher end. Um, I'd say in terms of the adaptations I've seen, it's definitely up there with the first goofy Street Fighter movie, Res <laughs> the fifth Resident Evil movie, which is honestly far better than you would actually expect it to be. Um, I, I have to say I gave up on Resident Evil after the second one, so I I'll, I'll have to check that out. Well, the second one's the worst. The fourth and fifth are the best because basically they become, a, they're kind of video game adaptations that are about video games. So like the main character gets extra lives and gains and loses super pa like power ups, and goes to different levels. Like it's super video gamey. It's fascinating. Um, see, so that's interesting because I see some things that I feel like go the wrong way because they don't respect the source, but then they they try to make it feel like a game. I think the best example of that is that awful Doom movie with The Rock, where they try to Ooh, shoehorn that... like first person <laughs> sections in and things like that. However, it didn't follow, like, the plot or even, like, atmosphere of Doom at all. It was just bizarre. It's a terrible sequence, and yet it's the one part of the movie that's memorable. Didn't House of the Dead do an entire, like... Yes, House just... of the Dead... <laughs> House of the Dead spliced in footage of the arcade game. It's... We'll have a different conversation about yeah, Doomable another time. Yeah, we can. Uh, I, I mean, I, I promise you right now, after, after just having this short conversation, I promise everybody listening that we're going to have uh, probably video sometime soon for the best and worst uh, video game adaptations. But um, this Submit is... Submit your answers. Yeah, put it in the comments below, whatever you think. Because um, I, I think recently there's been some Western efforts that haven't been bad. I, in, For instance, I enjoyed the Warcraft movie. I wouldn't say it's a good movie, but it's all right. Um... But even as far as animation goes, uh, there's a couple animes that I think I would probably elevate to be pretty good. The Resident Evil one, Devil May Cry, things like that. But a Western-developed video game adaptation, um, I would say this one's probably my favorite. I'm a little biased. I'm a huge Castlevania fan. Uh, I'm and, a huge Castlevania fan. I liked it. I, yeah. pro Like I said, I am super in the tank for those for those fourth and fifth resident evil movies and the goofy is all hell street fighter movie but um it's good it's like it's a good it's well done um i i don't think it's great and it really does suffer from the fact that it's very clearly the first third of like a two and a half hour movie because it is it's yeah very clearly adapted from the warren ellis script from like over a decade ago right i have um I guess I'll start with the negatives first. And my negatives fall into two categories. Uh, one is video game fan nitpicks. And two is just generally watching this, even if I had nothing, no idea what Castlevania was, I have these problems. And uh, yeah. my problems with, um, with it is the inconsistency in the animation is a big one for me. Um, there's a kind of charm to it. It reminds me a lot of uh, kind of like early 90s super violent anime. But there's some scenes where, like, they spent. You can tell that their their budget was limited, and this this uh, initially was supposed to be uh, one out of three animated movies. I, and I feel like Netflix probably was throwing this out to see what the reaction was before they did anything to it. So the budget was likely limited, and they obviously spent a lot of that on voice acting. So we we should also note that they have renewed it for season two, which will be eight episodes, mm -hmm. and we'll cover pretty much the rest of that movie script. Exactly. As I was saying, the thing about the animation is that they, like, I feel like they used it smartly because I thought it was, I thought the set pieces and design and the art style was, was perfect. It was pitch perfect for a Castlevania. And I thought that the action scenes, which is where you need it, were amazingly animated. Uh, the, I mean, spoilers, guys, there's going to be spoilers. Uh, the Alucard uh, Trevor fight was awesome. The um, Cyclops fight was also awesome. Yeah, the Cyclops fight. I feel like when it's weird because like it's definitely wants to have like a lot more humanity in it um, than a lot of video game adaptations really care to do. 
But I also kind of felt like the series, the show, both as a Castlevania fan, but also just as a, you know, fil filmer and a, or like television critic, is when it kind of just goes into these like elaborate set pieces that, with this like bizarre moving Eldrick castle. Yeah. Um, and I thought the creature design too was good, but that also leads to. Um, well, let me, let me go to my general complaints first, because I, I was doing that. Like I said, the animation is uneven, but the thing is, when it's good, it's really good. Uh, it's yeah. just there's some times where it seems a little static, and I, I feel like you can tell they cut corners. Uh, those scenes, you know, I, I remember, like, for instance, when Trevor's walking around uh, the the town, and he's talking to everybody about the speakers. They kind of, like, pan through, and they, you can tell there's so much static animation there. Um, but... Yeah when they need to ratchet up ratchet up they do it also is worth pointing out that that scene i think benefits or not necessarily benefits from the static animation but it works with the tone which is a lot more languid mm -hmm. and a lot more like quiet i think i think it was very good at where it spent its budget right um another general complaint is i felt like the pacing was a little weird i felt like it dragged a little bit in the second episode um yeah and it was just it's kind of hard to say because it's so short you know, so it's not like you can have a filler episode with four episodes. Not that it was a filler episode. It was it was all set up. This is essentially a prologue for the actual yeah, Castlevania adventure. <laughs> I think that's the biggest of my complaints, which is that it really is not a full, complete story. It's real. It's very much a setup. And and I and I get that like this is still the first third of a movie script, but it it I do think it could have used a bit more um the ability to be an actual complete season. I think it'll be great when, you know, it's all finished and you can just stream it all in one go, but I, agree. I still think that it's good to have seasons that are complete. I also was kind of mixed on the tone. Uh, this is going to sound really weird, <laughs> um, uh, but I kind of have like, with Castlevania, it's always had this kind of like light gothic tone that's always been kind of goofy, kind of violent. Uh, this... I kind of feel like some of the violence was a little like over the top for its own sake. Like the there's a sequence when Alucard basically whips a man in the face and his eyeball pops out. Trevor and Trevor whips the or sorry uh, Trevor priest. Oh yeah, we forgot this is an adaptation of Castlevania Three: Dracula's Curse. Right, you said Alucard. I'm just correcting you so no one else has to. <laughs> yeah, sorry um, about that. Yeah, I I, and I agree with you. I, Castlevania doesn't have to be a super violent series because the, the the game. I mean, there's a couple grotesque things in there, but it's more grotesque than it is gory. Like things like Legion, you know, yeah. you have some zombies spurting yeah. blood, but it, it's not known for as that sort of series. But I feel like it does fit the tone. Um, yeah, I do feel like there's a, a, and, a little bit more kind of wacky, irreverent stuff in Castlevania games. You know, like Yorick. You know skeleton yeah, without his head four. chasing down his head and stuff like that but i don't know how much room there was for that in a four episode series <laughs> i think once they go into the castle hopefully it'll get to change up a bit because dracula's castle is is like one of the best locations in the video game in like the entire medium of video games oh it's agreed. this bizarre creaking clanking thing that just constantly shifts i love the fact that they basically took an explanation for why the game's gonna have these different setups and just turn that into part of this elaborate lore and it seems like they're dracula's moving going castle with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh but the problem is that since this is a prologue we literally spend about two minutes in castlevania mm -hmm. and the rest of the prologue is inside in a village in Wallachia. Wallachia. yeah which which they i don't think even the actors uh pronounce it the same way i don't think anyone knows the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. correct way uh, to uh, pronounce that. Um, I, I, so I, this... I will say this as far as tone goes. There was some dialogue that was kind of cheesy, but it was perfect that it was cheesy because it fit like what Castlevania is. You know, what is a man? A miserable pile of secrets. You know, have at you. Like the, there's the, when the when the OK, so my favorite is um, the Blue Fang Demon who uh, has that awesome scene uh, where he eats the bishop. Yeah. Right before Trevor kills him, he says, We have an army! 
Panar me from hell! And I'm like, that's the most video game line I've ever heard in my life. That is, it's it's great. Like, I could see that, like like a, like a boss fight. Like, a, like, you know, you defeat a boss and the boss says that because it's a video game. It's kind of cheesy. It's kind of irreverent. Um, yeah, uh, my favorite line from the whole uh, show is kind of like that. It's so there's a part when Trevor has to go inside this dungeon to fight what turns out to be a giant Cyclops that is has um, petrifying powers. And he's like a stone Cyclops right out of the Belmont bestiary. <laughs> like, I love that. I um, love the fact that the Belmonts ha actually have like a video game <laughs> compendium on all the monsters they fight. Well, I mean, yeah, it's in the games too. It's numbered and everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and something I appreciate a lot is that you can tell that this is made by people that enjoyed the series and have a knowledge of the series. And there's a lot of winks and fan service without it being obviously fan service. For instance, that Cyclops is actually the boss of the level where uh, where you free Siphon. That is literally... Oh, I didn't know that. That is literally from the game. The, the only difference is I believe it's in a, a graveyard type of setting. But you defeat the... There's a statue in the middle that Siphon... You defeat the... Um, the Cyclops, and then she breaks out of the stone. It's like literally the same thing. It was amazing. Like, and they also do the same with Alucard in the games. You have to fight him to get him to join your party. Exactly. In. So I'm wondering if next season uh, we'll have... Grant uh, the Nasty! <laughs> um, you know, uh, Warren Ellis, who penned this, uh, literally has, has gone on record about Grant before. Really? Uh, yeah, because this is the same script uh, as we know from the bestiality scene, uh, which had been making, which has been infamous, by the way, in the Castlevania fan uh, uh, population for years now since uh, a draft of the script came out. They're like, they're not really going to do that, and they totally did. They had the guys at the uh, at the bar talking about effing sheeps. But anyways, he was saying he's like, sorry guys, Grant isn't in this, uh, and he's like, he's like, Grant makes no sense. He's all like, there's not. He's all like, he, he's like, why is there a pirate in landlocked? Uh, <laughs> why? And also, he's got, he's like, I can't take his name seriously. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if we're ever going to see Grant. Although in a different, because um, I believe this is responding to his blog. Is you could probably look this up. Um, but he did say, um, if we do get to Grant later, he's like, I'm going to go with the alternate alternate spelling, which is Grant uh, Dynasty. Or like Dynasty. That's, yeah, he's really into '80s uh, soap operas. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's just he is kind of a silly character. And uh, at yeah. the end of the day, in animation, where you're seeing more dynamic characters, because in the con in the context of Castlevania III, uh, si or not Simon, uh, Trevor is a tank. He's got a yeah. s very strong normal attack. He um, and a long range normal attack and a very poor mobility and a lot of health. Uh, Whereas opposed to someone like Sy like Sypha has really good special weapons, but very short range attack, um, not as good maneuverability. Alucard's kind of weird because his bat form and fireball gives him more like range and maneuverability. Uh, but Grant's whole thing is he's he's agile. He can he can actually change directions in the air, which sounds weird, but in an eight bit Castlevania game, <laughs> it's a big deal. Um, but like because air control sucks in Castlevania. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> in, in in a game. I mean, in a game, in a in a film where we're seeing a dynamic Trevor, which makes sense. You know, you're not going to have him just stand there and, you know, strut forward two frames at a time and whip. Um, you know, but he's like, you know, soccer corner kicking a, a short sword into a Cyclops' eye um, and throwing daggers everywhere. It kind of negates the uh, speedy, you know, <laughs> the need well, for, for that character. In that. I don't know. Uh, that's just me thinking. Uh, what's your thoughts on it? I think there is one value, which is that the series, you know, I don't think it needs a dedicated comic relief character, but... I mean, there's, I'm sure he could be written well. <laughs> um, and I like how the only real story from uh, the game was that the Belmonts were exiled and hated. And uh, they got that. That was the main story from Castlevania 3. So we're good. <laughs> I also, I'm a big... Uh, one of the things that I did like, and part of this is because I think the best episode is the first episode, because it's the one that's the most like a complete story, mm -hmm. is that I did think... I mean, it, this is an animated adaptation of a video game where you fight Dracula in a castle, and the castle in the game are called Castlevania. 
So subtlety isn't exactly uh, the series' strong suit, and this is very much not a subtle animated uh, series season, but I thought that the way they did uh, the story worked for me. It's like the idea that basically the church and Dracula are kind of responsible for each other's worst actions and attributes. Mm-hmm. That worked for me. Right. And and um, although, you know, Ellis himself is an atheist and I, I don't think there's any love for religion, the, the church is just... That's actually another issue I have is the church is almost like cartoon evil. But I mean, I guess it isn't, you know, subtlety isn't the series strong suit, like you said. So And they that, do... Well, they also do have the seekers who are basically religious uh, monks, but... Right. And not only that, but it, it it's more the institution than the actual religion. Because, I mean, these are demons from the Christian hell. They uh, Trevor finds the only uncorrupted priest in the town to bless holy water. So, I mean, clearly, like, the religion itself isn't what's evil. It's the men that are using it for their own political gains. Yeah, and, uh, and I mean, certainly you can find, like, more than your fair share examples of people abusing their station. But uh, I also just, it I think it works for me because... Part of the problem of the season being that it's a prologue is that you don't really is that you spend time in this small town but it's not that interesting of a town it's <laughs> kind of your generic medieval like town full of superstitious uh sorry stu- uh, superstitious types that's true but i mean i also kind of just want to see them go on their adventure and by the way the bishop was fantastic um yeah. just like chewing scenery just like over the top just great character who uh got his just desserts Although I've seen some fan speculation. Uh, they're like, do we know the bishop died? They're all like, we see some blood. We see people like, he, he could be resurrected. He could be a minion of Dracula. Um, um, and someone's all the, like, he could that, totally end up being the dark priest shaft. And I'd be like, that'd be amazing. <laughs> oh, that'd be great. Um, and also, like, of uh, uh, Shankar, uh, Addy Shankar, the producer from this, who we will talk about extensively later, has said that he would like to do other Castlevania games and adapt them. And I think uh, Soten, uh, Symphony of the Night, and the Sorrow games would be, like, prime adaptations. I think that. you have to do uh, Simon. I don't... The, the, the problem Simon, is, like, yeah. even even if we can do, like, Castlevania Adventure, the Game Boy games, there's more than... The problem with Simon is there's just Simon. But you do... Yeah. You can kind of do it as a two-part where you kind of have the lead-in of him, you know, in the castle, and you can add whatever characters... You can add characters and elements from any game uh for instance um i could be wrong on this and please let me know if i am but i'm pretty sure the actual like belmont uh like family crest and insignia i'm pretty sure that's from lords of shadow and it wasn't in any of the other games it might have been i don't know so they're not afraid to take parts uh or or ideas from other games even ones that aren't really good (laughs) <laughs> I liked the first Lords of Shadow. I liked it too. It was okay. I will say Mirrors of Fate and uh, Lords of Shadow 2, not as much as I was going to say. But I thought the first one was a promising promising start to a different take on Castlevania, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's a very pretty game. Like, it's honestly more... I think it honestly, the graphics hold up like to an extent that they look better than a lot of PS4 titles um, do. And... I think it has really great visual design. I don't really mind that it was very clearly not a Castlevania game from the start. <laughs> um, it is too long. It, I mean, it's basically an okay God of War club. Right. And Lords of Shadow 2 is... Yeah. Yeah, we, we can talk about good. Lords of Shadow some other time. We, yeah, we're going to stay on track. Source Gaming, we, we stay on track. We do not meander for more than three minutes. The Bishop, uh, by the way, is played by uh, Matt Brewer, who... Um, older viewers may know as Max Headroom or um, from shows like The Nick and Orphan Black. Actually, this is a pretty stacked cast in general. Um, the, it, it's really good. Um, and I, I, I think it's hilarious that some people are like, I wish I could watch this in Japanese. I'm like, number one, it's not an anime. It was meant to be watching in, in English. Number two, like it's, it's great, uh, the cast. I feel like some of the audio mixing might be a little uh, low at times. Maybe that's just me. Maybe, or, or when I'm listening to it on, I was listening to it on my headphones when I initially watched it. Um, uh, but yeah, dude, um, so good, so good. Graham McTavish as Dracula, also so good. <laughs> and uh, my uh, favorite is uh, 
Richard Armitage as Trevor Belmont, uh, who was last seen, at least by me, turning himself into a giant naked snake man in Hannibal. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think more more people will know him uh, from the Hobbit movies, where he was <laughs> he was a dwarf. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, no, he he hit all the right notes with Trevor. I like that. You know, Trevor's a lot more fun of a protagonist than I thought he would be, because they make him a drunkard. Yeah. They make him a guy, and he's he's justified. You know, he's uh, you know, in a lot of ways, he has the same attitude as dracula where he's like screw humanity these people don't deserve me <laughs> it's it's definitely interesting how instead of just having trevor and dracula be analogs for each other and i assume alucard in the second season will also be used as an analog to dracula but like the church is an analog to dracula it it like even though trevor is the protagonist i like that dracula and the way people are sort of re relate to Dracula remains this kind of central part of the show. Right. Um, it, like I said, it's it just, it's so hard because there's so little of it. So, I mean, many of my complaints are things that, you know, could be resolved just with a longer season because I would see more of it. I'd see more character development. Um, I, I, I'd see, and from a fan point of view, I would see music for, uh, maybe I'd see music from Castlevania, which is, insane to me that there is none <laughs> it, castlevania um, has one of the best uh like musical work of any video game series and even if they didn't want to get like the same like chip tunes or remixes i do think they should have gotten some of the composers from the series um i think you need and these are the songs i would say you need i think you need the beginning which is kind of like Tre uh, trevor's theme it was a uh, the first song from castlevania 3 um, I think you need Mad Forest because that's one of the most famous Castlevania songs and that originated in Castlevania 3. Um, you need Tragic Prince because Alucard's in there. And of course, Vampire Killer and Bloody Tears just because of Vampire Killer and Bloody Tears. You work that through a season, you're fine. What was that, five songs? <laughs> I, I do think um, it would have been good if they got uh, Michiro Yamane to do the music for the game, for yeah. the show. I mean, and the music's Even good. If, again, the music not. fits. It's just, you know, yeah. a little bit forgettable and it's a little bit disappointing because, I mean, the music is might be the most iconic part of Castlevania, to be honest with you. It's what people, when you when I think of Castlevania, that half the reason I want Simon Belmont in Smash Brothers is because I want a stage and because I want that music. <laughs> and the stage will be the clock tower. Ah, oh, so good. Speaking of which, how amazing was that? They actually included a platforming section through a clock tower in the show like how fan servicey is that it was really fun and again like castlevania especially the pre iga games although iga had this as well and especially in stuff like portrait of ruin like did take a lot of cues from like old-timey adventure movies and indiana jones yeah. like and like they always had like the big maps that you walk past they don't have that in this one but they do have these like death traps and giant puzzles and I like that stuff. Like, those are video gamey as hell, and I think they are fun to see in adaptations. Like, I think a lot of people kind of shy away from that and try to focus on, like, elaborate fight sequences in video game adaptations, but I think the gamey stuff is often where you find the most interesting material. Um, also, I like Saifa as a character. Um, I, I like that they, you know, she, she stood her own, she was you know might be the most powerful out of all of them i like that 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 scene where, where you saw like um uh, how in sync her and trevor were like already where it's by the yeah. way there's way too much falling in this. that's another thing there's so much falling like go ahead and rewatch it it's only four episodes guys and just like be like yep they're falling again but uh when they're falling down the the clock uh gear the the gear work area that's the most accurate thing in this to the games because you fall all the damn time in them because you have no air control and the platforming is bad and the Medusa heads are awful. Um, I'll get back to the Medusa heads in a minute. But my point before was how he whips to grab her and then she actually cushions her fall with the wind magic. And I'm like, oh, look at that. They're working together. Nice. Yeah. Um, as far and fan service, Alucard actually has the, it, what is it, reverse dragon punch? Is that the, the motion? to do the uh, special attack from the Alucard sword. He literally does the special <laughs> attack from the sword. <laughs> like, yes. Oh no, that, that fight's uh, very good. I do kind of feel like it does one of those like 
action shows where the where the, you have to have the two heroes fight and it doesn't totally work for me even though i know it's an adaptation and i get how it works in the universe but it had to be done and it was you know you you, you finish your video game adaptation with the boss battle so <laughs> yeah and i also do feel like admittedly this is because alucard barely has a role so far in the show but i kind of feel like He's kind of a cipher, like he's sort of this dickish guy who hates his dad. And like, there's little of the Alucard from the games, I think, but there's also not a lot to him as a character. So I kind of wonder what like people who aren't familiar with the franchise will take to him because it's such a big like reveal moment. Um, from what I've seen online, uh, you know, uh, the, the girls seem to like his looks. <laughs> I think he's going to be kind of uh, more of a, an aloof personality, which which you see a little bit. He, I mean, which he also has one of the the best lines. Uh, what is this a bar fight? Have some class, uh, which I think kind of sums up where I think we're going with this character, which is a good yeah. um, contrast to uh, Trevor, who's basically like a more dickish Han Solo type of character. <laughs> he's yeah. very, very much out for himself uh rough around the edges sort of guy but at the end of the day he's gonna do what's right you know and yeah. I, I think actually his journey sort of back towards redemption back towards being a hero back towards the belmont family legacy was also really rushed because there were only four episodes you could have a, a whole season of of trevor kind of finding himself you know yeah but at the same time i'd also that would stretch this incredibly long prologue even further. And oh, agreed. Same, same with the Dracula backstory. You could have done a lot more with his backstory uh, with Lisa and everything else, but you, you kind of need to get to get to the actual story of Gasoline. Right? Yeah, and I would have liked that more. Like, I think spending more time with Lisa, I think, was a really interesting character who got fridged, like, way too early. Because I think you could have had, like, a lot... Because I think there's something really interesting about someone who's so dedicated to good that she's willing to risk basically going into this like awful castle of this monster of a horrific dictator to get his secrets so that she can help people and i think it was kind of disappointing that uh she was taken out of the show so quickly hopefully now that alucard's back uh we could maybe get some flashbacks or stuff right it can also also if they ever get to a season that is symphony of the night which I, I think Symphony of Night is the second priority <laughs> yeah. for for the show. Um, then we'd probably delve more with flashbacks and Alucard as a kid and things like that. Um, but I was saying earlier Medusa Heads. Um, that might have been uh, my biggest gripe. And like I said, it's probably in a bigger season to see more. Uh, really, b besides um, the Cyclops... Yeah, it just seemed kind of like generic. I don't know if they were supposed to be bats or gargoyles or what exactly goblins they were supposed to be. Yeah, um, basically, for those who haven't seen it, Dracula's main army consists of one kind of beetle, dog, wolf monster, the stone cyclops, and otherwise it's just these sort of armies of gargoyles that eat babies and fly around killing people. And, I mean, those are in the games, but... The games are also known for They're not, having, yeah, you know... <laughs> to have, like, you don't have one skeleton or one ghoul or Medusa heads or mermen or, you know, any of these things. And I wonder, like, a lot of that can be stuff that you start seeing as you get closer to, you know, we talked about Lord yeah. of Shadow earlier, and that was kind of my, my problem. With, uh, one of my problems with that game, too, was I'm like, I get it. You know, you're out and whatever. But I feel like the closer you get to the vampire's castle, the more familiar things should start to see to see him. Well, also the weirder thing should start to see because this is a crazy Escher-esque castle that's constantly moving and reshaping itself. Right. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it could, like, I, I just want more things that remind me of Castlevania as far as uh, those designs go. Well, my biggest wishes for the next season, besides it, it just, you know, actually is good. That's number one. I want it to actually be good. But uh, kind of fan wishes are um, I want more monsters. I want music and I want Grant. Those are Grant and Nasty. That's what I want. So, um, yeah, I, overall, I I really uh, like this. I thought it was solid. Uh, I thought it looked like Castlevania. It's something I've wanted for years. I'm a huge Castlevania fan. I used to like wish 
that there was something like this, and and now there is. Uh, I thought the characterization was great. Um, yeah, uh, the like like we said before, the action was was top notch. It's just it's just short, and I hope that it's able to Sweet. sustain itself through a longer season. Um, and I hope we get more, man. I hope we see Simon's Quest. Uh, I hope we see Rondo of Blood. I hope we see Symphony of the Night. Um, I just wanted to point out that if they did um, Symphony of the Night as a second series, and then they did the Sorrow games, they would actually have a really nice triptych all based around Alucard. Right. Um, but I mean, let me just say this right now. Personally, I'm kind of tired of the fact that, uh, and and that's why with the whole Matrixvanias, I was I was fine with them moving away from that direction because the series kind of got off track. I love Symphony of the Night. It's one of my top five favorite games of all time. But I feel like the series kind of lost focus after that because it always was a story of the Belmonts versus Dracula. And, you know, it's not about Soma. It's not about uh, Shinoa. It's not about all these people. But you see, what I would argue is that it's not even really about the Belmonts. It's about Dracula. But that's what it became. But that's, I mean, it was always, you have, you had one side and that's, that's what it was before that. And Symphony of the Night, when it first came out, was a side story. You know, it wasn't really, and that's what it wasn't one of Dracula's main resurrections. He used to be resurrected once every hundred years, and I feel like there's a huge chunk of players that don't even really, you know, when they think Castlevania, they don't even really acknowledge the fact that it was an action platform, and that, that's what it primarily was for years, at basically the height of the franchise, up until right when Symphony hit. You know, I mean, I'm a, I am very much more of a fan of the Metroidvanias, so yeah, I mean, Igarashi's, you know, I, I, like I said, he he, I'm not gonna. Put any shade on the man he made some some great games but they became kind of these derivative experiences after a while too um so much so that there were two aria games that i can't i can't i personally can't even remember the difference between them. they're really good aria <laughs> of sorrow and dawn of sorrow both excellent um but and i i like uh, i like order of ecclesia better because it went away from that formula it wasn't it didn't as much try to recapture somebody that i, I mean we're, we're getting off that too. um I personally, though, would be upset if they glossed over Simon, who he's been in like 12 games. I mean, he's the face of the series, but I think we were, we were talking about this off mic. Yeah. But the problem is that Simon is the face of the Belmonts and the closest thing the series has to like an iconic main protagonist. But he's also in games that have only him. Like there aren't characters in his series. You'd basically have to make up your own thing and... Right. His, uh, that's why I feel like his game would be more Simon's Quest. You'd have to flesh out the villages, flesh out the random NPCs he talks to, uh, and tell us, yeah, tell a story of him trying to remove Dracula's curse. Um, I, I like, so I, I think the main ones that you would have to hit are, uh, three. And then if you go on to Simon's Quest, I would say Rondo of Blood, two, and that, to set up Symphony of the Night. Um, Instead of treating those like all separate adaptations, you make Simon's Quest Rondo of Blood. You just have Simon do all the stuff Richter did. Um, that would piss people off, but I can see it. <laughs> and actually what you could do is have Simon's Quest lead into Symphony of the Night. He tries to resurrect Dracula, and that basically becomes his actual possession by Shaft. Right. I, I think part of the issue with those that like one of the things is, is done well, especially if they introduce Grant, is that it's not really contradicting the games, you know, um, but it's hard because there's a lot of games. I, I mean, I, I agree with you. If, if you can tell a good story, you just tell a good story, you know, like I've said before on this very uh, discussion that I think the Resident Evil movies or at least Resident Evil uh, Afterlife and Resident Evil Retribution are probably the best straight like video game adaptations and they have like next to nothing to do with the game well right i mean if if, if you're not taking just your uh, you know what's your favorite into consideration i'd actually argue that the n64 games which i do not like very much at all i <laughs> i don't think i beat uh i never played curse of darkness which i hear was a better game it's one of the few castlevanias i haven't uh played and beat uh, but I did beat, when it came out, Castlevania 64, and that's why I, I didn't feel like playing the other one. Um, so I'm not like a huge fan of the M64 games, but they have uh, a lot of characters and a decent story, and I feel like they could actually be adapted 
really easily. <laughs> I think that's kind of the problem that we're facing with the Simon discussion is that we have the iconic main character, but he's like the one with the least interesting story. What, what, what if you were to adapt some of the aspects like Cornell the werewolf and Carrie Fernandez the young witch? Yeah. Characters that are analogs to that or even the same characters into Simon's story. Well, that's what I'm saying. I can see that, but you don't want it to be too name droppy. That's a that was an issue with Lord of Shadow. They're all like, and then we're gonna call this dude Cor- Cornell. Cornell, the just giant wolf man, and then uh, yeah, how they have these two giant thug like vampires who are called Olrox and Browner. Uh, yeah. Um, do you think we could maybe see more aspects of Symphony of the Night make it into uh, the Castlevania Three story? Oh yeah, I absolutely think they're going to ad- put in at least some Symphony of the Night stuff. It's incredibly important. They're already linking it to this with... I mean, obviously Alucard is in the games, but yeah. And Lisa's backstory. Um, yeah. We should also talk... Oh yeah. I said as well as Lisa's No, those backstory. are... I mean, Lisa's backstory is literally from Symphony of the Night. Uh, uh, I think we'll probably see that Succubus fight. Yep. I was going to say, uh, we should talk about the producer of this series, um, Adi Shankar, who is mostly known for being the producer of the 2012 uh, Judge Dredd adaptation with Carl Urban and Lena Headey, the fan, and those like very gritty like fan reboots of Mortal Kombat and Power Rangers that you may have seen um, online. Power Rangers. Uh, he is a character, and I kind of find him fascinating because he seems to have made it his goal to adapt kind of campy, interesting properties into these very, like, violent, uh, dark adaptations. I mean, obviously, Judge Dredd was super dark, and Castlevania has been very dark before. It, Mortal Kombat isn't. I, I refuse to believe that a game where that goofy is anything close to mature, but... <laughs> um... Mortal Kombat is over it, it it's over the top though. Um Yeah, here's here's the deal with them. I, I don't know if people can really restrain his vision. Uh Castlevania worked, I think I'm not gonna say despite of him. Um, because he, you know, it, it worked with within his vision, but it also had uh Warren Ellis and great voice voice work and you know other things going for it as well. I think it's important to point out, um, he has stated a desire to make, and this is a quote, a hard R Mega Man adaptation. I want you to consider that for just a moment, a violent, dark, mature rumination on Iceman and Gutsman. Um, I mean, hard, hard man, yeah. I mean, there's a guy called Hard Man that shoots giant um, fists, he, so I can see where he's going. He has actually With a this. couple. But anyway, he does have also another <laughs> animated project lined up in Assassin's Creed adaptation, and he has stated a desire to do Metroid. Oh, I think, I I think that his Assassin Creed, his Assassin Creed could be a phenomenal thing. So I, I feel like that fits once again. Um, really, it's. It's not a bloodless series, but it, it's fairly clean. It's yeah. not like a super gory series. So, uh, however, it, it is a very violent series. I actually it's very think violent, very he could series. do really well to Metroid <laughs> if he kind of like really focused on the darkness as a tone uh, instead of just a means to an end. Because Metroid, mm-hmm. like as this sort of weird science fictiony, horror-y, actiony thing, I think like. I mean, yeah. I mean, honestly, the are an alien. if you just had this like really creepy story of this woman kind of going through and uncovering this sort of like ancient dead civilization that used to be your home while fighting these giant monsters, um, I, I think it would be good. Uh, I, I, I think he, there just needs to be a little restraint because it can't be as. Uh, I mean, it, there's no reason it should be as mature. We're talking about like in know, terms uh, of blood, not in terms of tone. Metroid. Oh, oh, but you know, I'm talking. But I just want to say, there's no way Metroid could be tone-wise, you know, uh, just a- as I guess vulgar <laughs> is the way to put it. I was kind of not super sold on the vulgarity of this. Like, I'll probably maybe like it more if I see it again. Yeah, some of it, some of it was good. I'm Trevor F. in Belmont, and I've never lost a fight to man or beast. That was a great line. Um, sometimes it does go a little. Uh, over the top. Um, but I think tone-wise, especially, and it might work too, because Sam, Samus, for the most part, is fighting, fighting aliens, you know? 
like the grossness can come from like i mean what's the worst that she she comes across humanoid bug people space pirates i mean i think there's like a way you can do that where there's this like icky goopy i mean metroid has always been this like cavernous lava y icky like bulbous things with like giant orbs and little laser donuts it's like it's always been kind of messy oh yeah i i agree like i said i i think it'll work uh, or it could work. I don't know if Nintendo would allow him to do it. Yeah. But here's the thing. He's the sort of dude that we said Metroid, but next week he'll be like, I want a gritty, uh, hard R Kid Icarus. And he'd be like, maybe not. Maybe not. Like, you know what? He would be fantastic. You know, it's a perfect fit. He should do a God of War movie. <laughs> All right. Once again, though, we will. I, I think that's a, a good topic for another day. The uh, who, who we would like to uh, help different video game adaptations. Yeah. We should also say, if you have any ideas or would like us to talk about that, please mention it in the comments below. Right, yeah, if, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty open to suggestion here at Source Gaming, so if you have anything you want to hear, anything you want us to cover, uh, let us know. Um, I think on that note, um, this is a good time to uh, wrap it up. Uh, anything else? Any, any final, final thoughts, uh, Wolfman? I think it's good. I think it is... I mean, it, it's we were talking about this a lot. It's a prologue, and it's not a full story. And I, I have high hopes, but I also think it needs to, um, I don't know, go into weirder areas. And a flea man or two would be nice. Um, I, I, I get that. Like I said, there's some wacky stuff. Like a lot of the um, Igarashi Castlevanias have like random like furniture and stuff in it you can sit it's got a lot of weird idiosyncrasies yeah stuff. i love that but uh personally my my bigger issue um with it or my biggest fear is like i i loved it and like i said a lot of that's just because i'm a castlevania fan and i was worried i'd be disappointed and i i really wasn't i have a lot of quibbles with it um i want it to to expand into more into more things that feel even more castlevania like I said, like uh, more enemies, more, you know, weird little things, more callbacks without without being like they've done a good job so far of doing things like the platform without it seeing out of seeming out of place or, um, you know, too obvious as a video game callback. Um, but my my biggest thing is I, I just I, I hope that it's able to sustain itself uh, because it's such a small sample size, you know? Yeah, it's I mean, it's kind of weird because it's basically the second season is going to be twice as large. And it was very clear, I think, that. They were sort of testing the waters, and we'll see, like, how much, like, how better the budget is. <laughs> well, we'll be back uh, when the new, uh, <laughs> whenever uh, the new season comes out. I don't know if they've announced exactly when it's going to be yet. Um, anyways, guys, um, you can find uh, both of us here at Source Gaming uh, on this channel, on our uh, website, source-gaming.com, on sourcegaming.info. Um, you can find me on Twitter at 8-bit underscore spazzy. Where, they can, where can they find you, uh, Wolfman? Uh, they can find me on Twitter at WolfmanJew. They can also just find me at Source Gaming, where I am publish my articles. Sweet. All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed this. Uh, we will talk to you later. Bye. Take care.